Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press and we've invited a legal practitioner, Mr. Tunde Kolawole, to help us dissect the papers this morning. Good morning, Mr. Kolawole. Good morning, my sister. Okay, let's Thanks take a... for having me. Yes, thanks for being here. Us. So let's take a look at the top stories, uh, starting with the Punch newspaper. Autumn's attempted assassination. Governors, Middle Belt, others express anger. IG dispatches special probe squad. IG orders security beef up around Benue governor. Orders probe into attempted killing. Middle Belt Forum here is telling the federal government, don't sweep assassination attempt under the carpet. And uh, Fulani Group claims responsibility for attack, says Autumn won't escape next time. Blackout persists as Disco rejects 5,452.96 MW of electricity. Uh, Navdak warns Nigerians against fake AstraZeneca vaccination. Oshamelo Governor Probe, not a witch hunt, Obasaki. For scarcity, threatening airlines operations, says Onyema. Ogun free trade zone investments, about $300 million, and that's according to the chairman. NAPTIP probes AGF office top officials over human trafficking. INE sold ocean marine shares to Kumbo for 2 billion naira. Minimum wage, National Assembly raises panel to avert strike. NDLEA seizes 200 kilograms of hard drugs in Lagos, Abuja, Kano Airport. Ekiti killing three appear in Lagos today in court, says Fayemi. And we see a picture of traffic on the Oshodia Papa Expressway and failed portions of the road at Berger Bus Stop and Westminster Papa Lagos on Sunday. That's what we have on the Punch newspaper. All right, and uh, we'll skip to the Daily Independent uh, this morning, uh, see what major stories we can also find there. The big one there says, plug-in budget deficit falls, high inflation and job loss as uh, exports. Attack on Governor Tom, PDP slams Buhari, APC over silence. Party governors say it's invitation to anarchy and IGP orders full investigation. The PDP is in the news this morning, says why we prefer northern presidential candidate in 2023 to adopt Bala Mohammed Committee report on open, open bid for ticket. And also this morning, missing 4.4 billion Naira National Assembly Fund, Serap drags Lawan Bajabia Miller to court. Still on the Daily Independent, despite attractive valuation, banks fail to draw foreign interest. And uh, lubricant market faces challenges of multiple levies and low profits. Those are the major ones on the Daily Independent this morning. Let's go over now to the Nation newspaper. Rage over attack on autumn. Buhari orders investigation. Nigeria on life support, says Governor. Hijab. Baptist Convention pro protest in Kwara. Police arrest three over Ikiti by election. Suspects for arraignment. Stock exchange goes tough on investors. South South governors under fire over insecurity. Gawan pushes for rotational president. It's South South's turn, says Obasaki. CBN disburses $149.2 billion COVID-19 loans to households. 316,869 persons benefit in the first phase. Dangote fertilizer ready in one week, and Jack on Day will leave forever in our hearts. Stories on the front page of the Nation newspaper this morning. All right, um, let's uh, now say uh, Governor, it's uh, not Governor, I was going to say Governor, to Nicola <laughs> Wally. <laughs> if we have to, we might bring in the uh, business day this oh, so morning. So I get a profit. <laughs> but to Nicola Wally, let's bring you in here. The big one there, of oh, course, is uh, oh. the attack on Governor Tom. Let's, let's have you kickstart. All right. Well, let me quickly say that uh, the attack, an attack on one single Nigerian out of 200 million Nigerians is an attack on all of us because we are supposed to be our brother's keepers. And every life will matter in a decent society. So to that extent, I will want to sympathize very strongly with uh, Governor Orton, with his family, with his political party, 
and with the people of the new state as a whole. But be that as it may, you will recollect that I have been emphasizing that there are two types of banditry in Nigeria today. There is the rural banditry and there is the urban banditry. Rural banditries are those ones that take place in the forest and remote cities that would describe either as Boko Haram, kidnapping, cattle rustling, or what have you. The urban banditry is the one that is being carried out by military groups that the different politicians, the different political parties have set up in this country. So if that is the case, it is the chicken that is coming to roost in the sense that whether rural banditry or urban banditry, they were all set up by the Nigerian politicians. So when these politicians now come under attack, it will appear to me that it is the ticket that is coming home to root. It is the one way that the Nigerian politicians have shown that is now coming home to hunt them. But with specific respect to the United States, I am not surprised. You will remember that there is no love lost between the governor of the United States and the presidency. At the time, you know, when Beni was under severe attack, and then everybody was calling as a need for high-level security intervention and high-level presidential intervention. The president said he was sending the then ID of police to Beni State to look into the challenges there and find solutions to it. Lo and behold, when the presidency said it despite the then IG to Benue State, the man didn't go, he was there in Abuja. And lo and behold, to the dismay of the average of all Nigerians, the IG, through respected presidential order, was never for one day sanctioned. For me, something is pitchy in there. Something calls for questioning. Something calls for certain persons happy with what is happening to the people of Benetti and to the governor of Benetti, who has been loquacious, who has always had the courage to take on Mr. President at different times and different places and on different occasions and on different issues. All right, still, still on this, Mr. 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 Kolawole, let me also bring yes, this in. Uh, it, yeah. it, it was one of the reports that I saw this morning, uh, a group called the Fulani Nationalist Movement uh, that yeah. has claimed responsibility for the attack. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and they, of course, uh, stated um, you know, a few reasons, mostly because of his uh, anti-grazing policies. And um, you know, uh, they, they, they said it's you know, in, in honor of the Fulanis across you know, the world in 15 different countries. Um, so yeah. what, what would your response be to that, you know, that there is already a group that has claimed responsibility uh, for the attack on Governor Otom? Yeah, of course, the, who are the people behind the, this group? On more than two occasions now, Governor Otom has come out to say the Mieti Allah people, the uh, Katu Koto, whatever they call it. You know, there are two organizations claiming to be represented the interest of the Fulani people in Nigeria. Governor Tom has always said that these two group people are after his life. And that at some of their meetings, he has been their mark for elimination. And if you also look, the people that have been terrorizing the people of the United States, according to Governor Tom and some of the security reports that we have had, are said to be Fulani airsmen who I have described as the rural bandit. So what has the presidency done? What investigation has the DSS done? What steps have the army taken with respect to the complaint of Governor Autumn that the full and needs are the ones terrorizing the people of the city and they want to kill him? So if you link that up with the refusal of the DNIT of police, to go to payments day when he was ordered, and the refusal of all the machinery of the state, the president, the PSI, the police, and all of it, to investigate the complaint of Governor Autumn, that certain Fulani leaders have their marked for elimination. Then you begin to get a clearer picture 
that there is no love lost between the people of Prime Minister and their governor and the people at the centre of Africa today. So all these things are interwoven. I level, I wire politics, very dangerous politics, lack of respect for statesmanship, and the failure, the, the, I would say the total collapse of security at all levels, whether the level of police, whether the level of the army, whether the level of the DSS, immigration, civil defense, and war and war. Okay. And until we keep this uh, architectural collapse, until we are able to prepare the umbilical court between the presidency and those who are the helm of affairs of security, so that those who have our security see themselves as being loyal to the Nigerian constitution and to the Nigerian people <coughs> and not there to preserve any government power. Okay. We are never going to find a way out of this. All right. This has happened in broad daylight. Look at what has happened in the, the state in the by election too. The military group of the political party went to attack voters simply because they are not too happy or they, they don't want the direction in which they want to vote. So the next thing is to disrupt it. Mm. So it's both rural bandits and urban bandits that we are contending with. And I say with all sense of responsibility that the Nigerian politicians are responsible for all of this. And okay. the APC in particular should be held accountable for this crisis in the country. All right, Mr. Kolawale, let's move away from security now to politics. It's 2023 elections. It's top of mind here. And we see uh, Nigeria's retired uh, military general, uh, we're talking about Yakubu Go and his pushing for rotational president. He spoke over the weekend and said that for the interest of peace, it's better for presidency to be rotated equally among you know all the states in Nigeria. He also recommended that there should be two vice presidents in the country, that one should come from the zone of the president and another should be elected during the elections. While the PDP has your own, you know, thoughts about how zoning wants to be, the APC has theirs, different groups has theirs, different groups going ahead to purchase, uh, or raise, raising millions of Naira, you know, for the purchase of, you know, presidential tickets ahead of time for their preferred candidates. So there's so much, so much talk about the elections, even though it's you know, still, still a while, while away. But let's focus on, on Gowan's, you know, uh, two cents on this matter. Do you agree when he says, you know, this should be rotated and there should be two vice presidents in the country? Yeah, with uh, respect to governor, I mean, to uh, former head of state, Gowan's uh, contributions, he is a man that is highly admired by the Nigerian people. In fact, you can describe me as a jolly good fellow. He's comfortable with both the right, the left, the center, and then uh, whatever. But with that as it may, I won't send on this program. I am not too comfortable with rotational presidency. I don't think it is likely to work. We should always aspire to have the best of our brains manage the affairs of the Nigerian nation. Rotational presidency is not likely to produce the best of the human kind, of the best talent that we have. That is one shortcoming. Furthermore, you must realize it has been said that there are more than 350 tribes in Nigeria. If you now begin to do rotational presidency, when is it likely to become the turn of the Tokuma? When is it likely to become the cult of the Wari man? When is it likely to become the turn of the Wari people who speak a variant of Yoruba? When is it likely to become of that of the Ijo persons? So that poses a lot of danger. My prescription from my reading of the Nigerian situation is in fact that we should collapse the present political system that we have and evolve a new one so that we have, maybe it will look like just one political party, which I would describe as a kind of a Nigerian People's Congress. In that Nigerian People's Congress, people from different status of our society and profession will be represented in parliament and government. The soldiers will have their representative, the teachers will have their representative, the market women will have their representative, the uh, teachers will have their representative, you media men will have your representative. 
Mm. People may collect or get to be represented in government. Mr. Kolawale, Mr. Yes. Kolawale, yes. a lot of people will argue. Mr. Kolawale, a lot of people I will argue that Nigeria will not function as a one-party state. There's just a diversity of interests, a diversity of you know ethnicity, if there, a diversity of everything really. How do we begin to make this work? Yeah, when you when you look at my recommendations critically. You cannot uh, describe it as a one-party state. I am talking about an inclusive government now, in which every status of society is represented, other than the professional politician that we do have in there. If the students have a representation, if the market women have a representation, mm -hmm. if the health workers do not have their representation, if the teachers have their representation, and you media people have a representation in the National Assembly and the National of Government, when the budget has been debated, the scarce resources that are available to the society, all of you will be there to decide in what manner, in what best ways will these resources be allocated so that no aspect of our life will suffer, so that the people in the National Assembly will not begin to appropriate as much as 60% of the national revenue to mm -hmm. themselves for doing nothing, so that the bulk of the money can be invested in infrastructure, it can be plowed into health. The army will, will, will know their need. They will be in the assembly. They will table their needs in there and we all debate it. So it may look like a one party state, but in reality, what I'm advocating is a kind of an inclusive government in which all Nigerians are going to be in government, not on the basis of party, but based on the sector or the, 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 the group that they represent. All right. Uh, Mr. Wale, we obviously have a lot of uh, steps that need to be taken to give us, you know, a better political space across Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, le let's move away from that now and talk about, um, you know, the National Assembly. There's a story on the Daily Independent, 4.4 billion Naira National Assembly uh, fund. It says, uh, Serap drags uh, Lawan Nangbajabi Amila to court about missing 4.4 billion Naira uh, National Assembly fund. Uh, your quick reactions to that also. Well, I don't know too, too many times I see the the Sarah people going to court over one issue or the other. Ordinarily, that is the way it should be. In a decent society, you don't begin to engage in self help. You try to resolve issues through civilized manner, either by going to court, either by going to negotiation either by doing consultation or conciliation, either by doing demonstrations and war From my reading of the Nigerian airlines, the political airlines in particular, since they returned to this civil rule in 1999, it would appear to me that they are impervious to change. It would appear to me that they don't, they are deaf and strong. It would appear to me that they are not, are not capable of smelling the rock that we have in this society. And if the situation is that bad, all this going to court is not likely to solve the problem. I would rather begin that all the different status of the society that are the recipient of our political class to begin very serious affirmative action now. Demonstrations and rally when things are not being done properly. Occupation of the National Assembly. Occupation of certain offices and institutions that are messing up our life. That is the only way we can change the direction of this society. Especially when you are dealing with an, uh, with the kind of airline, the role, the Bukani airline that we have, the expatriate airline, all of them carry foreign passport. They are not Nigeria. They are here as colonial masters and as federal governors, as expatriate legislators, as expatriate uh, uh, vice president and president, and uh, as a expatriate uh, and local government chairman. So it is good to go to court. But what difference is it to make for this kind of people? Look at the number of court cases now. The court docket are clogged with all sorts of cases emanating from the politicians. And that is affecting the core issues that the court should be dealing with. Contracts, economic activities, thoughts in the area of negligence, and the malfeasances that we begin to see in some of these other areas of our life. Or too many of these political cases is bugging that paper. It is time for a public actor. 2023 is very close. If care is not taken, 
It is the same set of people that we are criticizing today that will return to power in 2023 and will be back to square one. And then mm -hmm. Nigeria will start eating from the dustbin. And after there's nothing they're going to eat from dustbin, they will begin to slaughter themselves as food. Okay, uh, let, let's now quickly bring in the uh, business day uh, this morning. See, we, there's a story on the refineries there that uh, we might want to quickly speak on. Um, business Day newspaper says uh, Nigeria's fiscal position remains uh, precarious despite rising oil price. And also, it says a tale of two refineries, what Nigeria can learn from South Korea. Actually, just two big stories there. Uh, inflation tops discussion as MPC meets today. All right, so let's also bring you in on the uh, proposed uh, rehabilitation of the Port Harcourt refinery for $1.5 billion. It uh, created a lot of co controversy over the last couple of days. And, um, you know, there have also been reactions to that. So let's, let's hear what you think uh, about re yes. re rehabilitating uh, that refinery. Mm -hmm. I have been seeing a lot of reactions uh, with regards to that. One of the reactions I've read is from uh, Dr. Peter Sain, the founder of uh, uh, Stambik. Uh, this bank, USDP or what have you? Stambik Bank, I, I believe. Exactly, Stambik IBT. He has called for a debate on uh, the proposal to really rehabilitate that, uh, uh, those two refineries. Well, my take is as simple as this. Uh, like I have always said, there are refineries that are older than our own, around the world that are still working fine. My uh, refining petroleum product is not rocket science. It's something that humanity has been doing for more than 200 years. Nigeria has the expertise. I do know that the Faculty of Petroleum Engineering and Geology, University of Ibadan, has been there for more than 30 years. So if that is the case, we shouldn't be having any problems with, no, is that? We shouldn't be having a problem with running our refineries. But we are having a problem with our refineries simply because those refineries have become conduit pipe for our airlines. Right from the time of the military era, go and do your study. Especially since they return to this evil rule. It is when the election is at hand, when the election is coming, that the political class begins to award jumbo contracts for the rehabilitation of the refineries so that they could have money to power their political ambition. And what do they do when they say they are, they are, they are rehabilitating? They go there and then they will paint the tanks and then paint the machinery and leave the core issues undone. And then when you say you are rehabilitated, some of the equipment in there may have become obsolete. And when they become obsolete, they are not equipment that you can walk just to any nearby engineering shop and purchase and replace. They are not like spare parts. You will place orders for them. Before they produce it or manufacture it for you, it will take two, three years. Just like the Tucano attack a uh, uh, chopper, I mean, uh, attack a uh, plane that we want to buy. So these things are not as simple as that. One would rather want to see if they are desirous of really rehabilitating the refinery, have an action plan that will cover a period of maybe two, three years and put it on the table of the Nigerian people. This is uh, advertising open in the newspaper. We want to uh, rehabilitate this refinery. These are the areas that are at. Let quotations come from all over the world, from both indigenous businessmen and then from people from outside. And you also do your own stock taking. We have uh, quantity surveyors. We have a uh, marketing expert. You send them to different places of the world to go and give you a survey. How much is going to cost you to really rehabilitate these refineries? So that when you get quotations from people who are interested in helping to, 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 to rebuild them, I mean, to do this rehabilitation, you have something to compare. And then you'll be awarding a contract at a reasonable cost. And then the Nigerian people will have value for their money if truly right. they want to do that rehabilitation. But the way Amaya they are going about it today tells me that these people, like the other old regime, the other people before them, want to use this rehabilitation as mere means of raising money for the 2023 elections. And the Nigerian people should say no to all of that. All right. To Nicola Wale, thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning and for sharing your thoughts. Uh, these are very important issues.
And uh, with more conversations, we hope that we find the right uh, path forward as a country. Good morning once again. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure talking with the two of you. <laughs> okay, All same right. here. All right, so we have lots to dig into, and sadly, we won't be able to bring today in history uh, at the moment. But we'll take a break here and come back to discuss a big issue, water management on World Water Day. <laughs>